Hello, everyone. Did I spook you? Well, me again. How are we doing? This is the session on girls, boys, and adolescents that are on a company. One more time, we have a great panel of many Latin American countries represented here. The colleagues will make their presentations and we'll offer a Q&A space. Hopefully it'll be long enough so that you can clear any concerns and also ask write out questions to our wonderful presenters. As you know, this is one of the three main issues that we have identified in the background paper and for the annual meeting, which is increasing numbers of girls, boys, and adolescents who are displaced both with their own family and unaccompanied. And in Latin America is one of the main displacement crises of children and adolescents. It is estimated that around 25% of all people being displaced are girls, boys, and adolescents. UNICEF is also estimating that each year there are more and more boys and girls who are moving unaccompanied. They were either unaccompanied or alone. We thought opportune to have a full table just for this thematic. And so we can talk about this same themes in the future. I have some presentations here and I will read them. I will introduce each of the presenters. Um, they're going to provide their wonderful contributions to us. The first presentation is from Martin Peña Segovia. He is the coordinator of humanitarian action of the UCO office in El Salvador. He's a social worker with over 15 years working in humanitarian causes in Central America, especially in processes of uh, reduction of disaster risk and preemptive actions. For the past 10 years, he has been working in a protection effort in groups in situations of vulnerability within the context of crisis, especially with women, children, and adolescents, and forced displacement or regular displacement of groups. This allows him to enter institutional processes for elaboration of routes, protocols, and protection strategies of groups in situations of human vulnerability. Thank you, Martin. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here to be able to share all the experience from the EDUCO office in El Salvador we have been working on for the past years, specifically with two prioritized profiles, which are children and adolescents in displacement, forced internal displacement, and those who are going to be returned with urgent need for protection. To contextualize this a little bit on the humanitarian situation in El Salvador, specifically, El Salvador is a country found in the list of humanitarian crises have been cataloged, categorized as the forgotten crisis. We have a context in which threats, kidnappings, forced disappearance, murder, extortion are root causes for displacement, displacement of many families, including boys and girls. And during 2023, the Norwegian Congress for Refugees included us in the country in the list of countries that have crises that are not being taken care of. And currently, we are facing the, the security policy from El Salvador government. It's still generating displacement situations for boys and girls and generating abandonment because their primary caregivers have been deprived of liberty. Also, according to monitoring done by civil society organizations, we have identified that 203 children and adolescents have been detained within the framework of these security policies. And CICR during 2022 identified 
that armed violence generates displacement and migration. We have a juridical framework for protection approved in 2020 for people in conditions of displacement. However, despite having had four years after its approval, it has not been implemented. And according to this scenario of humanitarian needs that we're working on with organizations from um, NGOs and with since 2023, we identified 1.3 million people are under dire protection needs. We are going to share right now with you some protection strategies that as EDUCO, we have been working on in the last years or so. We have been working on a case management mechanism in which we have considered the core or centrality of children and their families. And we have worked in an articulated fashion with responsible people in order to build capacity so that they can increase their responsibility role. And this is a mechanism done with a complementary approach in order to avoid duplicating of efforts for humanitarian reference. And we have a reference route for case management. A spe some specific strategies that we have worked on in education and re reduction of emergencies, we have done this through three different dimensions under education. First, the right to education, right for education in emergencies, and the rights of education during emergencies. Derecho a la educación en emergencia. Hemos apoyado todo el tema. We have supported the topic of school reintegration through vouchers or cash vouchers that we have delivered to the families. We have also delivered scholarships for education, con continual education for girls and teenage women, the rights of emerging education through the strengthening of educational staff in educational matters. We have developed self-care journeys and stress management journeys and the strengthening of the national protection systems. During the third dimension, we have worked the orientation on comprehensive health, food nourishment, specifically working with the cafeterias in schools and promoting the participation of boys and girls, our humanitarian actors, efficacious humanitarian actors. We have worked with protection community scenarios, strengthening the infrastructure at community level, identifying strategies of protection jointly and implementing action plans and education and promoting articulation with the authorities or the responsible authorities. We have also worked on a mechanism of cash assistance and vouchers responding specifically to population in need under the conditions of forced internal displacement. This has been an approach through rights promoting family autonomy, but also maintaining the anonymity of these families who are under the displacement status. We have reduced risk of security by reducing or closing the gap of re-victimization and minimizing new risks. We also believe it's important to bring the co into context the humanitarian situation that nowadays humanitarian workers are experiencing in El Salvador currently because there are a lack of visibility on the internal mobilization phenomena by the authorities in places of responsibility and on the other hand, we do not have official data that could let us know which are the actual number of people who are on this mobility 
situation. We have implemented some strategies and efforts that create awareness, create visibility on this phenomenon of displacement and mobility. After the COVID era, we identify the impact on boys and girls suffering from displacement, and we were part of the table of the civil society against internal force displacement in El Salvador, from which we have worked on strategies. And late, lately, we have been publishing La Mosca Azul, which is a pamphlet, and we also edited a short story book bringing into evidence this situation for boys and girls and adolescents. And I will show you a video in which we see some of the stories that are related in the book. Okay, Martin is going to show us a video now. Someone placed a cone behind beside me and they shrouded my body and so a policeman is taking care of me while they're going along the road that's what they told me they were going to protect me but that didn't happen there are people complaining that the bus is delayed someone was saying that maybe i was celebrating too much because i overslept and i should have been drunk you hear the rockets the firecrackers the noise from the fair no one sees the piece of wire on my purple neck my family doesn't even know that i was going to be here but when they broke into my house they said retire delete the complaint or and get out of here oh they should be in jail because of what happened to this girl and it's not that i was brave but we really didn't have any place to go so we stayed behind however we locked the doors and windows from inside the house i didn't even sleep well because i was imagining in every which way they can kill anna because they never knew when to shut up or carlota they don't even know why they did it to her. After what happened to Carlita, for Ana, I had to ask for permission from work. And in the end, they still fired her. This morning, I heard some firecrackers, and I remembered that there was a fair in the town. I asked Ana to help me bring the trays to and the table to the park so we could sell tamales. I placed myself in a good corner, so by nighttime I should have made good sales, and I was really happy for that. I saw some children playing, and I felt pity for on Carlita, because she was so lively, is now so sad, and she has to be kept locked indoors all day long. By 8 o'clock, the sales were more stable, because everybody had gone to the dance. And I told my neighbor, please take care of my table while I go to the bathroom. But they displaced me and threw me here. Who would have heard that from all the dance music? I don't know who had the great idea of covering me in this shroud, but I'm grateful. It must be ugly to see death's face on an old woman like me. Don't you see that she was killed? Anna is telling the police, they're going to kill us now. But the police said, take it easy. You're frightening the tourists. And I was, I was begging the police to take us away where they wouldn't follow us. The police ignored her like she, like he ignored me. Maybe in his mind, we're already dead. From the book, The Loneliness of the Wanderers. Thank you, Martin, for that video. And if there are people who didn't quite get it and want to 
know more on the context from El Salvador that we are not providing enough detail because there's not enough time. But you can do a bilateral talk with Martin after the session. So we're going to move now down to Colombia. We have two guests from the SOS villages. These are Ricardo Rico Suarez and Laura Vanessa Dorado. But I just never know which name they go by. They will be presenting on the SOS villages or aldeas on unaccompanied or separated children. Está en gestión social y tiene una... Laura is a social management specialist. She has a long career on international protection on the context of migratory processes. Rights currently, she is project manager on aldeas with ideas focus on children's protection and social projects for the improvement and access to rights and basic services. And Ricardo, he's a psychologist and he has experience in project management. Currently, he works as the project director and innovative projects for Aldea in Colombia. And throughout his career, he led projects focused on the social development and children protection within the context of vulnerability and humanitarian crisis. Thank you so much, Mari, for that presentation. Darla, saludarlos. It's a great pleasure to greet all of you. It is a great pleasure to be here uh, who have been in Puerto Rico before and in we were part of uh, the Inf Aldeas Infantiles. This has been a long work and today we're going to do a presentation that says safekeeping, safeguarding the future, effective strategies for the protection of children and adolescents in the context of prolonged humanitarian crisis in the here and now. Aldeas Infantiles is an organization this is a federated association present in 37 countries worldwide, 20 of which in Latin America and the Caribbean. Maybe we are the direct care organizations, or if not the largest one, one of the largest ones for that. And our differentiation factor is that we are an organization offering service of sheltering in the in family context again we offer lodging for families for boys or girls be it in the context of development or humanitarian context good afternoon as mara said my name is laura dorado i work with this Aldeas Infantiles also for over seven years now. It is a pleasure to be here. And like Ricardo said, because we are offering a service, family type service, because Aldeas Infantiles, it is essential that a boy or a girl would grow up within a family environment as close as possible to their own family in synchronicity with the rights of children. We are all here experts and we know the negative impact on a child's life by the fact of not growing within their family unit. That's why we invite you today so that given the roles of each one, we can join forces as much as possible so that even during humanitarian crisis, we can ensure that boys and girls will grow up with their family or within a family environment because there is a safe and protecting environment maybe we can avoid as much as possible for them to be institutionalized. When you go into Aldeas Infantiles, you welcome them saying, welcome to the largest family in the world. We are the largest family in the world. And that's what we want to transmit to them during the inboarding when they are 
coming. That's their introduction. Welcome to the largest family in the world. And as we say, we are sheltering in a family model adapted to each country and their policies and situations. We embrace these children in an environment that they can feel they are growing up in a family environment, having that privilege, even though they may have lost mother and father, and having a most akin family environment as possible. Now we're going to understand very quickly what's the situation for Colombia in particular, situation live, that children are living through in Colombia within the context of a prolonged humanitarian crisis. And I need to highlight that prolonged humanitarian crisis. For those of you who don't know this data from Colombia, specifically for the year 2022, we were approximately 52 million inhabitants of which almost 10 million people were recognized as victims of the armed conflict. Of this last figure, around 3.7 million people are boys, girls, and adolescents, meaning approximately 39%. By 2023, over 47,000 boys, girls, and adolescents suffer affectations because of different situations generated within the framework of the armed conflict, such as recruitment, use, abuse, displ displacement, getting out of schools or other similar affectations. So everything that's affecting the children in Colombia, we must add the situation that comes forward from the migration from the Venezuela, those from Venezuela. We have some relevant numbers based upon the ones that they mentioned this morning, 7.7 .7 million Venezuelan migrants, and there's an amount in Latin America, and 2.8 million approximately are located in Colombia. From this last number, around 861,000 are boys, girls, and adolescents. In the last years, the operational capacity of protection in Colombia has an overload in the care of 211 percent. As we know, other than what has already been mentioned, in Colombia we have a critical evidence, which is the situation that is occurring in the region of Darien. UNICEF Panama, back in 2023, 113,000 children and adolescents crossed the Darien jungle by themselves. Based upon 2024, like up to the month of April, like 30,000 boys, girls, and adolescents. So what is the current panorama? As Ricardo was mentioning, a humanitarian prolonged crisis plus a system of protection that has collapsed, generating difficulties for the identification of these profiles especially children whom are not accompanied and children in risk because of the armed violence. There's an evidence of a lack of services adapted based upon their needs. So yes, as I was stating previously, it's a humanitarian crisis, which is prolonged, armed for more than 50 years. I'm 47 years of age and all of my life, I have lived in a country with armed conflict and we have not accomplished that some generation can grow and live in a country without a conflict. Other than this, the topic based upon migration, what is happening in Darien. And we are before a panel of experts. I won't stop at this. You better than myself are aware of all the risks that children go through whom are not accompanied, who have been separated in the midst of an armed conflict. But I want to highlight one of them, the first one. The big problem and what's hap what we see is to avoid the separation of families. When a boy and a girl can grow in their family, in their family environment, and clearly 
where there's protection, where there's care, amidst the difficulty, it makes a difference. And this is what we are trying. And what we're trying to do is they were reflecting some interventions that are occurring in the country. And what we do is that we show forth some interventions and we have the support from the humanitarian arm and the European support from ECHO in which we're working on this in a temporary manner for the management of cases. We have those on the fields who are identifying risk by the utilization or recruiting of children who are migrating, who are by themselves are separated. And Laura was stating of the capacity of this program is overloaded, it's collapsed. So the administration has the difficulty of what are we gonna do with that child? So what we're expecting based upon that monitoring and evidence of protection that goes far and beyond of just identifying it, it's accompanying the state, accompanying the authorities that they can do effective protection. In the case of recruiting, take the child out of the risk, the zone, risk of zone, risk zone and put them in a safe place while the case is being managed, that alternative care, family type care. What does this mean? Is that it's not institutionalized, it's up to nine children in a house with up to three caregivers. So, because we also have to take care of the well being and the health of those who are caregivers of the children. And what are we seeking? to support the state in managing these cases. Why are we supporting the state? Because we don't manage the case directly, but we're there accompanying them and looking mainly that they can get back into society. If it's not possible, then we do all the advocacy for the care that has been chosen for the boy and girl will be the most adequate based upon their situation. Not all methods of protection apply to all children, but we have to make sure that the state gives the adequate care. Well, um, for Aldeas Infantiles, um, this is Children's Village, it's important to give services that are different based upon the context. When we talk about young people in some experiences in different contexts, in Aldeas Infantiles, Children's Village, we have identified that around 90% of the adolescents and young people do not take the route of protection. It does not call their attention to want to receive any type of service from the protection service from Colombia. The reason for this is because what they think of the system of protection, they think that they're gonna be detained and they're not gonna get to work to send resources to their family of origin. But with the support and contribution of the Canada Embassy and also from UNICEF, we implemented a project that materialized a dream. In the presentation, we have two participants of the project that I'm mentioning. In the first photograph, we have Paola, who could do her entrepreneurship of fast food, or Andrea, who wanted to have the most delicious bread in pasto. It's a department in Colombia called Nariño. And in this experience, we could see how with services that are adapted based upon the needs of adolescents and young people, we can contribute in great manner, the development, the personal development, and also personally. And we can make these adolescent and young people to continue dreaming. And they don't think that their dreams are frustrated and that even in the midst of situations and of different inconveniences that can be presented, there is hope. Well, just here quickly, we'd like to show you a little bit of the presence. The needs of protection in Colombia, the special needs that have been mapped for humanitarian coordination and the presence clearly we have a capacity to accompany that response. 
the topic of the challenges. So we more so have thought of being invitees to, invited to this panel. What can we bring as a contribution to experts like the ones that we have? And after many conversations and just um, going through some conversation in the networking spaces that we have had, there's a central topic that we want to bring it as part of the conversation, as part of the alliance, the services of hosting, the hosting services, family hosting services in family context, which is the one that we're looking at currently. It has the perception of being very costly. And the question that we ask ourselves is, if the standards show forth a need of protection for the boys and girls, why is it? Are we having a problem with the cost of the effective protection of a boy and girl? So I think this is a discussion that we need to have with the donors and also with the governments. Why? Because let's think of the social return of that investment. Because if there's prevention, it can be more cost efficient for each dollar attending to boys and girls, then there's less in protection. But that dollar in protection means that we're going to put that on the positive. Then we're going to have adults that don't have some emotional delays, that do not have psychological problems. We're going to have adults that are not going to perpetrate violence. So this is just like a reflection based upon the challenges as an organization. This is what we're bringing to the table. There's some minimum standards. We are aware of them, but when we implement them, we know that it's gonna represent a cost of personnel. We have to take care of the caregiver. We have to take care of the place. It's not any place. The boys and girls should have the best care possible, especially when they're in very difficult situations. So this was the message of the challenges and there are many more, but we mobilize this conversation, a conversation from the Alliance and we hope to get to do this of how the donors and those who cooperate get to do this. So for us, the challenge in ECHO when we're invited to participate, and this is a project that we're starting, the conversation was very difficult in regards to this because the rest of organizations are doing a very important work in the part of prevention, especially on protection. But clearly uh, these are different, but the humanitarian action is the one that has understood that effective protection, the message that we stated in these extensive conversations is as follows, a boy or girl that we take out of a, zone of conflict from Colombia because of the risk that they could be recruited. It's one soldier less and one person that's not going to die. So this, it has all the value, all the possible value. This is a great challenge. And uh, this is a call to action. Let's mobilize these difficult conversations and we are safeguarding the future here and the future, protecting boys and girls. Thank you. Thank you, Ricardo and Laura. Up to this moment, uh, we saw two crises that we considered as forgotten. Both El Salvador and Colombia had an original Refugee Council report last year, and I saw this year it's not there. Honduras has comes up as country in Latin America, but it's important to get to know this. It's two crises that do not receive a lot of international finance, the means of communication, they don't get much focus from them, and from the internationals. Um, the diplomacy of the countries, it doesn't get so much attention as other crises in the world. And possibly for this reason, they're also prolonged because they obtain less focus from the international community. These countries, we go to Brazil with Deborah Greiser, whom is an investigator. Um, she's an advisor for organizations like UNICEF, and she has a lot of influence in the north border in Horaima and also with 
oh, with IOM and with the measures of the state, the non-governmental organizations and associations to protect these boys and girls. Hello, good afternoon. It's a great pleasure for me to be here with you. As Mara spoke, I do investigation a couple of years now. I'm here representing the University of Sao Paulo Unicenter. It's a university, a private university, and it's part of an investigation group of human rights. And the Federal University of Santa Catalina where we have a group of investigation of the rights of children and adolescents in Brazil. Nayuska is the name of the project, Children's Rights. I would like to start with a poem that was written by our, the professor Petrino Verser. Um, she's a specialist in adolescent and children in Brazil. Boy, how not to play with toys, cars, dolls, kites, Listen to stories, tell your dreams. This is the way of me being a child, but I'm in danger. I don't have a roof, and many times I don't have love. I need much more than a country that will welcome me. I need a home. I need a chimney. I need to feel warm and a feeling of belonging. I have a right to mobility, to migrate and be welcome and also to be loved and hugged, to have a place where to go to. And this place is mine, I came home. Well, she wrote uh, this for my investigation for my doctorate about my grandchildren in Brazil. And this, uh, at this time, I'm gonna show you the presentation, so what we spoke about in the morning in Brazil, we have the judicial framework, the federal constitution from 1988, in which we have the integral protection. This was the convention, childhood convention, and we have the statutes of children from 1990, in which we have the prioritization of the rights of children in Brazil. We also have a lot of interest in children, a translation, the best interest for children coming from the convention. Well, um, here there's a little bit of the history, what happened in the last years of the Venezuelan migration in Brazil. Historically, in 2015, we have a raise of the flow of the displaced migrants in Horaima. And after that, in 2017 is when we have the first play, Ya no Cuerda. So this is the first one in Brazil. Uh, this was for the Wadao population. This was a place for them to stay in Janokoy, uh, the people who live there, for children and adolescents. There are children that live in this shelter and it has been for five years. It was gonna be something temporary, but they stayed for longer. And then uh, in 2018, the Operation Acogida started, we call it, which is an initiative of the federal government. And then of UN, it's militarized, and this is important. So welcome operation in Brazil. With this, we have a law that created the Federal Committee of Assistance in Emergencies. After this, back in 2019 is when we started the project of children protections whom are not accompanied, separated, and undocumented with UNICEF in Horaima, in AFSI, Brazil. It was. In 2020, we have, let me see, we have the management, oh no. <laughs> So we closed the border due to the pandemic of COVID. And then in 2021, we opened the border, but only exceptional cases for those that were not accompanied, children not accompanied and documented and separated. So then after we opened the border completely in 2022, well, here, since we already spoke about numbers so much, we have an international number 
Of 7 million Venezuelans or refugees in the world, in Brazil, we have 510,499 from migrant Venezuelans, uh, 35 or 40 percent are children and adolescents. As I had already mentioned, um, we have this with the data. It's an ever-changing data, but this is the approximate. But today in Brazil, we have 8,000 people that lives in the shelters of in the Operación Acogida in Horaima. This is the R4B platform. The platform of Latin America that has the numbers of the refugees. And here uh, you can see that the numbers of the children, it's in Portuguese, but it speaks about the children who are not accompanied by their families, those who are separated, the children who are not accompanied. So, so what we have here, this sample, and the ombudsman in Brazil, every time a child starts from the border, there's an interview, a form of protection, then the defenders, of uh, the ombudsman's office. So they listen to the children and then after the child goes to the police and they can ask for a refugee and how the majority of the children are, are accompanied by the parents, 1,117. We had some that did not have any documentation. Some of them were non-documented. And from these 266 without documents, undocumented, of the children that were separated, we have like 2,153. So, and there we can see uh, that the children not accompanied, 2,023, we had 597. After you can look at these numbers, over here, uh, just for you to see a little bit about the Operation Acogida, welcome operation. In Brazil, the first image we can see the border control. And in the operation, what we do is reception, documentation, and vaccination. All the service in Brazil is free. So we, so Petrique Pataraima, Pacaraima, where all the Venezuelans come in when they get to Joraima at the border in Venezuela. There is a picture of the refugee in Hanokoida, where we have the Quaraibe. So um, the majority of children are adolescents that are there. Then we have the process in which when we have a dis voluntary displacement to other states in Brazil, this happens in Brazil because Horaima cannot absorb all the people. So, and there's no work. So that's why many people go to other places. This is a strategy of the federal government. This is like a support to the International Organization for Migration, ILO. So over here, you can see the network of protection of youth and childhood. So there's a picture of the ombudsman. Um, we call this in Portuguese, DPU. They do all the process to listen to the adolescent and children. And in Brazil, we have a joint resolution of the Council Childhood of Council of Brazil and the ombudsman office, the National Committee of Refugees. Uh, we call CONARE and, and the migration Sinigi. From 2017, there is a protocol of the attention of boys and girls who are not documented, who are not accompanied at border. So this change in 2022 um, with the reach at all the territory with other measures of protection for the children who are with their parents and don't have documentation showing that this is their parents. So we change it a little bit to give them a, more protection. So we can see that there are groups of Guadal families. There are many Guadal families that don't have documentation. And we can see that there's a lot of drawings. So when we do the interview, the children can design, they can draw. This change a little because this picture was before the pandemic. Before the pandemic, all the interviews were could be done electronically. So they do this um, 
through a processing system. No need of having somebody there in person. This was in Pacaraima. They're doing the interview for Buena Vista, which is the capital of Horaima. After we have a picture of the justice for children and youth, we have a multi-professional group that speaks Portuguese and Spanish that support the migrant children with the interview. So this can be done with video cameras. Um, there is this with the support of UNICEF. They do all the translation uh, supporting the children throughout their interviews. We also have the consul. This is a permanent organ of Brazil of the Statutes of Childhood, ECA, from 1990. And they help with boys and girls who are migrants. And this council helps them to have protection and access, access to services from the government and from the state. Over here are strategies of prevention and care that we have from UNICEF. I would really like to talk about the protection of those who are not accompanied and undocumented with their identification of all the children that helps them also with the part of migration. And then we have the friendly spaces, the one way called the super friendly spaces, super friends. This name has been chosen by the children. So this is a very important information over there. I had the map of Brazil in which you can see that in 2022, we had like 25 super friendly spaces in the north region of Huraima, in the Amazon, and in Belém. And now it changed a little. We have a situation with the rain currently and with the support of UNICEF and the climate catastrophes. There are also like 10 spaces that become less than that are going through this situation for climate change. So over here, you can see a picture of when we do the active search for family members, a family unification. This is a quite difficult topic in Brazil because sometimes it's a month, six months until we can find someone. And what we do first is to look for a family or somebody close to the child that's in Brazil. And then we have the support of the tribunal, the children tribunal, that the child can go to another city. There is a need of a judicial authorization for them to transit. So at the airport, we have to go with this authorization up to the destination of this child. Just one moment. Very well, over here, we have the vulnerability situation of the migrant children in Brazil that many of you have already spoken about. It's a situation of many other countries, but we have the family separation, like my colleagues of Colombia spoke, of suffering violence and discrimination, not having access to the health services, education, transportation, the situation of the services, happens exactly when the people do not have documentation. In Horaima, we have an advocacy very close to public services for those who are migrants undocumented. But in other cities of Brazil, they're very big. When the Venezuelans that don't have documents arrive, they do not want to give them access to the hospital or they don't want to enroll them into school. This is important to advocacy and UN and civil society that everybody can have access to rights in Brazil, even though they do not have documents. So undocumented migrants, we have a situation of work in childhood, forceful marriage, organized crimes or trafficking, human trafficking. It happens more with children whom are not accompanied. From this image, uh, for me, it's quite harsh because it's an adolescent that is an orphan. It's a drawing that I got to know him when he got to Brazil. He was very nervous. He wanted to talk about his situation and he did this drawing in which you can see his mom and his dad and on the bottom, he has the dates that they move, his mom and dad. 
It's a very difficult image. On the bottom, he writes things like, I miss you, a flower died. I love you. There are many harsh phrases. It's an adult son that would like to work because he was working in Venezuela and in Brazil, they cannot work. So she was very sad because she needed money to live. She went to an institution, a host in Buena Vista. Well, I'm sorry, you have one more minute. I'm wrapping up over here the challenges of the good practices that we do have at this time with the situation of those non-accompanied and separated or is the assistance in the state of Oraima and the state of the government, but for the UN as well, civil society. After you can see a picture in which there's a school for Guadal children, all the Guadal children are out of the school. So then we started to do a work with Horaima as an organization of civil society with UNICEF. There were teachers from Brazil and Guadal. It's an initiative that started with civil society, UNICEF, and now the school is a nexus of Pacaraima schooling. So it's a good practice of ours in Brazil sent to Venezuela during the pandemic because there were many children from Venezuela and from Brazil that were living in Santa Elena, which is a border city with Horaima. They did not have access to the internet. And this is a very, this was a work with the government of Venezuela to send to these children that were in Venezuela to send the service to them. I'm about to wrap up. Well, I would just like to tell you that I'm going to wrap up with a phrase that I wrote in a book. And it says, if you deport children without knowing why they would make the journey to this country, you may be deporting them to death when all they were looking for was life. Thank you. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Deborah. Y gracias también por señalar temas en común en las presentaciones. Thank you, Deborah, and thank you for pointing out topics in common in during the presentations. I'd like to recommend research. It's a systematic review of evidence that we have on conditions in which children and adolescents are migrating in Latin America, not only from Venezuela, because every country in Latin America has migration. Those who are not from the region think that only people from Venezuela migrate. So this was a good systematic revision from, uh, it's called Children on the Move in Latin America and the Caribbean, a review of evidence. I recommend highly that you read it. It's very good, a systematic review, and you can see there which are the main issues affecting a large majority of children or great groups of children. We saw particular cases in these countries. And if you want to know more, this report is simply awesome. Now let's open the floor for a Q&A. Thank you to all the presenters for their contributions. And hopefully the attending public has a lot of questions for our friends up here in this Please raise your hands and Kata will hand you a microphone so you can ask your questions. Thank you. Good afternoon from UNHCR Colombia. I'd like to ask a question specifically to Aldeas, to the program that you mentioned, this modality of temporary sheltering and case management. This temporary sheltering that you do, and do you do verification of rights administratively? And once you do that, I think it's interesting to be able to hear from your successful experiences or good practices that you mentioned to do this advocacy for the accompaniment of case management, especially when the administrative authority is very reserved 
and they take long time during their process of case management. Since you have undergone good practices that maybe you can tell us here about that accompaniment. Thank you for your question. I believe the key for the administrative authority to be willing to collaborate and to work is that the temporary sheltering service solves the administrative authority a real problem. Because when they come, they show up, a boy or a girl, they really don't have anywhere to welcome them. So in a, as a response to a prolonged crisis, we have that service. A first good step is the willingness for the from the authorities to continue working with the program. And as you mentioned, case management is responsibility of the authorities, but you have to work with them. Sometimes the capacity, the capacity of the state is already overwhelmed. So we accompany them to identify the family, extended family members, see how we can as much as possible so that the boy or girl can return to their family. And this came from the effective collaboration from the very get-go when we helped resolve a problem to the administrative authority. And if you cannot do that, but having been able to collaborate and accompanying the management of that case from the get-go, it allows us to suggest different modalities of care. Colombia has a robust care and protection system. It's collapsed, but it's robust nonetheless. And if you can align or suggest actions so that the modality could be the most pertinent. To complement that, what Ricardo mentioned, definitely this case management depends, the sheltering depends on the profile of the child, boy or girl, or an adolescent, whether it's unaccompanied or separated or in, at risk because of the armed conflict. So we work very hard with the protection system, but they haven't identified that the service is pertinent and appropriate because the state may not have the operational capacity to, to run this process. Not only for reunification, but also do a reintegration process so that the child is within a safe and safeguarding environment so that the child doesn't return to the initial at-risk situation. And for the profile of a child because of risk of armed conflict, we look for all possible situ possibilities with the extended family because the administrative authority may decide to return them to their family and that way we have been able to help. Any other questions regarding this particular issue? Thank you. This is for our Brazilian colleague. Well, first of all, I am agreeably surprised by the experience and the good practice that Brazil has shown and they continue to have with taking care of unaccompanied children because what you mentioned and presented to us, the response was very effective and it was able to be appropriate when needed since 2019. And we could say you have been pioneers in the region to be able to do that. Facing that context, I have two questions. Number one, how did you build up with the government entities and civil society to be able to reach this good practice? And if you have any information on the children, if they were able to be reuni reunited with their family and how they're doing, if that happened, and what are their conditions after this process? Buenas uh, Why, thank you for your question. Well, this process is a little bit slow. It takes a lot of dialogue. 
while the international organizations and civil society and the government, because as you see, as I said this morning, in Sao Paulo since 2015, there was a justice service for unaccompanied children, and you have a multi-professional team in which French, Portuguese, English, and Spanish were spoken. And in Horaima, services were saturated, and the tribunal didn't have the capacity of running all the interviews, and you have the Ombus Dam from Horaima that every two weeks they changed the vision and they needed two advocates to undergo through all the interviews and we needed the written statements and being able to listen and it started getting off the tangent so we had to focus on a very delicate dialogue process and letting the government know that we had this situation and then also the service of sheltering didn't have enough space for all the unaccompanied children and we started working with aldeas sos sos aldeas for temporary sheltering and then the government started to increase the sheltering places, especially for adolescents, because unaccompanied children are usually older than 12 year old. And it wasn't easy. So we tried to work together and with a lot of dialogue. Regarding now the situation of family reunification, this is a somewhat complex subject because we just don't have enough resources to do everything. And when I was in Horaima, I cannot say about right now, but back then in 2018 until 2021, we played a role in which we had the telephone numbers of the people from the team and there was a focal point and you had to constantly be in communication and for exceptional protection situations, you would send one of the team to the final destination where the child should have been. And you also had a, airport services for unaccompanied children. And children took longer, many months to just figure out how they were doing. Right now, I'm not working on accompanied children. So I just don't know how it is going at the moment. But it is very difficult to, hand, to handle everything because you have no contact with this child who was being sent back to Venezuela but could be back in transit into Brazil or another area. So it's very difficult to follow up. Hola, buenas tardes. Mar Good afternoon, Martin. It's very interesting your exposition of what's going on in El Salvador. Eh, pero yo luego me, eh, me siento con usted but I'd like for you to let us know a little bit on stigmatization of the humanitarian worker that you mentioned. Please tell me a little bit more about that. Okay, I was saying there's an interest. Tema del desplazamiento forzado interno. Si tú... From the responsible party to make visible the children. If you want to generate data, you are becoming an enemy. You're painting a target in your back. And that implies... Hacer cualquier tipo de coordinación con el titular de... It limits to, to do everything that you may have to do with someone working in the government, the responsible party. Así que cualquier información oficial se da a Any official information in El Salvador, sometimes it is given through social media and they can expose you so that you can become a target of harassment or persecution and any other uh, bad tasting things that can compromise your security. Actually, I was going to ask the same. Can you talk about the strategies that you use to take care of each other, to take care of your colleagues so that you can continue on with your work? Well, I was mentioning a little bit that the civil society table against internal force displacement exists and a lot of agencies for cooperation. So through the identity of this table, we make the publications. We use the logo and not our institutional 
signs. Another element that the word force displacement is like a non grata word. We talk a lot about human mobility now, so that allows for dialogue. Thank you, Martin. Any question? We have someone in the back of the room. Good afternoon to everyone. I'm Iris Vasquez from Iris International in Ecuador. And this is open to the panel. Which are the mechanisms or what actions are you carrying out to protect humanitarian teams that are working within context precisely of unaccompanied children or children that somehow are being recruited or seized by armed groups or their suspicion that they could be recruited by these groups. What sort of mechanisms are you taking? What sort of suggestions can you have for example, to, for Ecuador, who is facing right now this particular issue. In the case of Colombia, well, unfortunately, we have been doing this for many, many years, dealing with this problem. And there are moments and there are moments. Right now, we are at this juncture in which in the humanitarian activities and effective protection represents a sizable risk in certain areas, but basically the exercise from within the civil society organizations is about the strengthening of the state staff in charge of protection. So sometimes we simply say that we demand from the state when they don't comply, but we have to recognize that there are brave civil servants that they can go to the rural areas, pick up the children, take them out of the danger area and bring them into the protected areas. And that still happens. And I guess it works within each context. So the response is basically to coordinate with the state in Colombia as civil society organizations. We cannot do that. The protection context doesn't allow us to do it directly. So we have to maybe be the liaison with an administrative unit that would lead that process. And when it is an origin and fast protection process required, then the state institution has created a rapid response mechanism so that we can do a rapid movement, sometimes with cooperation with economic support to have the resources to offer protection, which means that organizations may be fronting the exercise of picking up the child from the risk area. Uh, bueno, uh, a respecto de eso, do... Well, regarding that, what I can say is that in Brazil, we have a public policy for children who are under life threats. And those who are under this type of threats may be related to criminal organizations and drug trafficking. The program is called in Portuguese PEPACON. It's basically the children and adolescents protection program who are for those who are threaten, their life is threatened. That's a ch Brazilian child or adolescent whose life may be in danger. And we write, we register the person in the program. This is a federal program and the child would be under protection and they will need to be moved to another city. They cannot reside in a city under uh, which they have been threatened. We have many places with armed conflict, but now with migrant children, we have factions from Venezuela and factions from Brazil. And if there is an identification that the child could be recruited, we need to change then. We have to move the child 
to another location. And that happens also with adult Venezuelans. If, they are, if their lives are under threat, we also move them to a different place. And we use the support of the International Red Cross as well. Gracias. Buenas tardes. Thank you. Good afternoon to everyone. Dinora Velasco from UNICEF Bolivia. The question is for Aldeas SOS, Ricardo and his team, especially under the assumption that when we are in the face of minors who may be accompanied or separated from their families, the idea is not to institutionalize them. So when you accompany this case management that you have done in Colombia, helping the state, if you can tell us up to date, a good practice, how many of these children, boys, girls, and adolescents have been able to be reunited with their families? And also to ask you about these cases, if this is replicable in other countries, because for Bolivia, this is a big challenge also still to do this work from the state and for the agencies to be able to accompany technically so that we can achieve this. This is a topic of great concern to us. Thank you. Okay. Something that Aldes Infantiles started to work on is to recognize that each and everyone has their own special value proposal. Everyone knows a little bit about something. We know about welcoming, about sheltering. So this reunification is not done by the organization. It is done by the ally with whom we have been working for this to happen. So I don't have the right figure. It could be over 1,000 cases in the past two, three years for cases of reunification, but this has been in coordination with IOM, with UNHCR, in within the platform or framework of conventions that we have been executing. So if the child is within a safe and protected environment, maybe case management could take more or less regarding the child's profile. And they complement each other. And as I said, these are organizations like IOM or UNHCR that help and support this topic, especially along the border in Northern Santander. And usually the family would come to Cucuta and that's where reunification would take place. I don't know if this can be done in other countries. We have tried with Venezuela in particular. Aldeas Infantiles. Our team with Aldeas Infantiles in Venezuela can support us in that process and some similar elements may happen in El Salvador. And so the teams not to compromise the operation of sheltering children for development or within the context of not being accompanied or being separated that are coming from Venezuela, then they are abstaining from do this of articulation. But in essence, basically, you have to work in tandem. You have to complement each other, look for your appropriate partner, because there are organizations who are promoting that type of reunification. Well, in addition to what the colleague from Aldeas mentioned, I like to point out that very recently, Colombia signed a MOU with Venezuela for the searching of family members for family reunification, searching for documents. And we as organizations will play an important role within the framework of being able to offer all our tools to be able to do this case analysis and accompaniment in the administrative figure that exists in Colombia. I don't know if that same management figure is in existence in other places in Latin America, because we in Colombia uh, will have the last saying for the well-being of this child, boy, girl, or adolescent, when we are trying for the best interest of the child to try to re reunite them with their family members, where the best interest of the child is always the utmost 
to carry out the logistics, to carry out reunifications in the best way possible, handling logistics either through air or land or water transportation. Thank you, Karen. That's exactly what I was saying. That's the principle of complementing agencies. Thank you so much. If no more questions from the hall, let's close the panel. As I said 48,000 times before, the idea is to start creating bilateral dialogue with each other, establishing networks, collaborate with each other, get to know people who are working in the same thing. So please just come and touch base with our friends, our colleagues here in this stage clear any concerns you may have from the presentations and thank you to all our marvelous presenters.